This video is going to cover the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis of the endocrine system, the sex hormones, and more specifically how they produce the menstrual cycle, and a little about their role in pregnancy. And I will talk about GNRH and GNRH analogs and the mechanisms of action of hormonal contraceptives. So I just wanted to do a quick overview of the hypothalamic and pituitary system before jumping straight into the video. We have the hypothalamic hormones, which are secreted by the hypothalamus, which is part of the brain. The pituitary gland is attached to the hypothalamus and each specific hypothalamic hormone will trigger a specific pituitary hormone to be secreted by the pituitary into the blood circulation, which will then um, go for the specific target organ and have their programmed effect. The hypothalamic pituitary gland gonadal axis. The hypothalamus releases gonadotrophin releasing hormone or GNRH. GNRH triggers the pituitary to release either a follicle stimulating hormone or luteinizing hormone, and these in turn target the gonads. In men, FSH and LH stimulates testosterone production and testicular growth, and in women, they are part of the menstrual cycle and ovulation. So a key feature of GnRH is that it is released in pulses. So when it is in slow pulse mode, it triggers the pituitary to release FSH. And when it is in fast pulses, this makes the pituitary release LH. There are GnRH analogs, which are mostly agonists of the GnRH receptors. So these include luprerelin, gaserelin, and tryptorelin. So exogenous infusions will initially cause a transient increase in sex hormones, but with continued non-pulsatile stimulation causes inhibition of FSH and LH, which in turn causes reduced levels of estrogen and testosterone. GnRH analogs are more potent and have more sustained action than GnRH. And these are used to treat conditions which are dependent on sex hormones, for example, prostate cancer, which is fed by testosterone, and endometriosis, which is aggravated by estrogen. So let's go into the roles of the sex hormones in the menstrual cycle. The endocrine system is highly complex and intricate. Hormones tend to have more than one effect, and the hormones and their effects work in concert with each other. Arguably, one of the most impressive examples of this is in the menstrual cycle and pregnancy. GnRH releases FSH, and follicle-stimulating hormone, true to its name, will start off the menstrual cycle by activating a follicle in the ovaries. When a follicle is activated by FSH, it will grow and mature along with the ovum within it secreting estrogen as it does so, typically for 14 days, which is when ovulation occurs. After ovulation, the empty structure is now called a corpus luteum. The main hormone the corpus luteum secretes now is progesterone. It will secrete progesterone for a further 14 days after which it degenerates, unless pregnancy occurs. Estrogen and progesterone in turn induce cyclic regeneration of the endometrium. The endometrium is the lining of the womb, the key function of which is to receive a fertilized embryo egg, should there be one. A menstrual cycle occurs typically over 28 days, although this may vary between individuals, and can be divided into two halves, where the first 14 days of the cycle is called the follicular stage, and the second 14 days are called the luteal stage. During the follicular stage, FSH induces one follicle and the ovum within it to grow and mature. The developing follicle becomes a temporary gland and secretes estrogen, which causes the endometrium to regenerate and thicken. And then on day 14, GnRH pulses ramp up to induce a spike of LH, 
and this causes the mature follicle to rupture and release the ovum. At this stage, the endometrium should be at optimal thickness in order to receive a fertilized ovum, should there be one. The empty follicle then turns into a corpus luteum. The corpus luteum then secretes progestogen for 14 days until it dies off. Progesterone maintains the endometrium and also suppresses the secretion of GnRH. So during the luteal phase, no FSH or LH will be produced. And as for estrogen, the corpus luteum actually continues to secrete estrogen, although in smaller quantities than before. If after the 14th day of the luteal phase, i.e. the 28th day of the menstrual cycle, no implantation of an embryo into the endometrium has occurred, the corpus luteum will die and stop secreting progestogen, or basically progesterone. The drop in progesterone simultaneously triggers the discarding of the endometrium and reactivation of GnRH pulses, thus restarting the menstrual cycle. So if you were to start taking a progestogen exogenously at this point, you would effectively extend the luteal phase and inhibit the menstrual cycle from going back to the beginning. This is the basis behind oral contraceptives and injectable contraceptives. There are three mechanisms behind the contraceptive effect of progestogens. The first two mechanisms are due to the anti-GnRH and anti-estrogenic effects. So there is the inhibition of follicle development and ovulation and the inhibition of endometrial regeneration, which leads to thinning of the endometrium, which reduces the chances of embryo implantation. And the third mechanism is actually not GnRH related, and that is cervical mucus thickening. So the cervix is the neck of the womb and the passageway between the womb and the vagina. This is where the discarded endometrium exits the uterus. And during the fertile window, sperm is allowed to traverse through it to enter the womb into the fallopian tubes. But otherwise, the cervix has a vital role in protecting the uterus from pathogens, especially during pregnancy, and will seal the passageway of the cervix with mucus. And under the influence of progestogen, the cervical mucus thickens and becomes impenetrable to sperm. This third mechanism is actually pretty important and is even thought to be the main mechanism behind the contraceptive effect of progestogens. The ovum, once out of the follicle, can only survive for up to 24 hours, whereas sperm is able to survive for up to 5 days. So the window of conception starts from 5 days before ovulation until 1 day after ovulation. Should the ovum be fertilized, it then needs to implant into the endometrium in order for the pregnancy to be successful. Once implanted, it will then secrete human chorionic gonadotrophin, or HCG. HCG is able to maintain the corpus luteum, enabling it to continue to secrete progesterone and maintain the pregnancy. HCG is also the hormone which is detected by pregnancy tests. During pregnancy, the corpus luteum will continue to secrete progesterone until week 10. And then after that, progesterone secretion is taken over by the placenta, which will also be secreting estrogen. A woman will produce more estrogen during one pregnancy than throughout her entire life when not pregnant. Progesterone and estrogen are the chief hormones of pregnancy. And as well as their effects on the uterus, they also have numerous other important effects on the rest of the body to support pregnancy and to prepare the body for childbirth and breastfeeding. And that brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for watching.